In January of 2022, I predicted that the market would crash. Shut up, Shut up. I predicted that there would be bank failures. The water will spill over the tops of the bulkheads at E deck from one to the next, back and back. There's no stopping it. The pumps. If we open the, the doors. The pumps buy you time, but minutes only. Failed stable coins. <laughs> predicted the stock market would fall, that bonds would suffer. <laughs> SPACs would suffer. <laughs> and cash would be the best asset to move into. In fact, you could see those videos in full linked down below, both the Titanic crash part one and two, which I edited and posted in January of 2022. They're still live. Back then I was made fun of for suggesting people should move to cash because they thought, oh, well, inflation is so high. Why would I move to cash? Of course, that ended up being the right answer. Moving to cash gave you the opportunity to buy things cheaper in the future. Now we, are at a point in the economy where at some point the market will crash again, but we don't have the clarity that we did at the beginning of 2022. Beginning of 22, it was pretty clear that the market was going to crash imminently. Presently, we don't have that imminence, but we can predict how the next crash will form, so that way we could be prepared when we start seeing some of the early signs. So in this video, we are going to go through the three steps of how the next market crash could unfold. We are going to go through each of these three steps and explain them starting now. The first thing we have to know is we have to throw up on screen the history of the Federal Reserve interest rates. What you're going to notice is that usually when the Federal Reserve cuts rates, it very nominally cuts rates when it cuts rates slowly. If anything, it's more likely to raise rates again before cutting rates dramatically. Instead, the Federal Reserve usually cuts rates when we're about to move into a panic, into a disaster. That's when we get serious rate cuts. And so that's why in this video, we're going to explain how these three steps could lead to the next market meltdown. Again, I wanna be very clear, I'm not calling for a mega crash or correction anytime soon. I don't have the best clarity in terms of when this next crash could come, but I think it will follow these three steps on screen. Let's explain one at a time. First, artificial intelligence. There is a lot of enthusiasm around artificial intelligence today because we believe that artificial intelligence will lead to more productivity and therefore more output. Faster vaccine research, uh, faster and more conclusive legal research, faster and more conclusive finance, financial research or investing strategies, whatever it may be. That could entirely be possible and boosting productivity will delay when our next market crash occurs because the more productive we are as a society, the more we can withstand the bumps along the road that might otherwise be deemed black swan events that could crash or collapse an economy. Productivity is everything. We need productivity to increase. However, how can artificial intelligence actually mislead us in productivity? Well, this is where we get speculative. So, we have to make the argument that let's say artificial intelligence is presumed to do this for productivity. It basically means we get more and more productive and productive and productive and productive. But artificial intelligence, in my opinion, isn't actually growing in this form of exponential trajectory. I think what we're getting a little bit more is we're getting sort of this advancement in processing big data that looks a little more lumpy. So we have this slow growth in big data and then we get these sort of stair step ups. And these stair step ups are really useful. They're moments in artificial intelligence like a chat, a GPT, where all of a sudden we can take big data analytics and make it happen much more efficiently. We can get to that next level of neural nets and machine learning to really accelerate, hopefully, productivity. 
problem is, when we get to a market that assumes this trajectory for artificial intelligence, and the reality is we're stair-stepping, well, at some point, we are going to create this. And this segment right here is the mess of malinvestment. Malinvestment is basically where we throw money at projects that we think are going to be the future. But the reality is the progress of artificial intelligence is nowhere near this level yet. In fact, it was Jensen Huang of NVIDIA himself who suggested that GPT was no more than an imitator of the average or the mass of society. This is why, even though GPT can be fantastic at ingesting an entire PDF and telling us and giving us suggestions, can it really advance our ultimate productivity? Ah, well, to understand our ultimate productivity, we have to understand what productivity is and what it's not. See, most of us think, well, of course, if I can ingest a whole PDF and into GPT and I can get all of the answers that I need versus reading it and I can get so much more work done in an hour than I could otherwise, then of course my productivity is going to go up. But see, that's not necessarily true. See, we have to understand the difference between productivity and efficiency. Let's think of this. Let's say you have one hour of time. So this right here is one hour. And let's say that you have one hour to read a 40-page PDF. GPT enables you to ingest the core parts and understand that PDF in, let's say, 30 minutes. So this is your GPT effort right here. And let's say without GPT, it would take you the full hour. So this is your no GPT. Okay, great. So what was the product of this hour of time? Well, let's say you spent 30 minutes with GPT and you spent 60 minutes without GPT. And then that next 30 minutes after you finished your work with GPT, you're kind of like, all right, I'm done. And you kind of just stand around the water cooler doing nothing. Well, in this case, you were 2x as efficient with GPT. You essentially got the same amount of work done in half the time. That's fantastic. So you were twice as efficient by using artificial intelligence. But your productivity changed zero. So zero change in productivity. Now, we need to be able to fill in this segment with more work. So a second PDF for you to actually become more productive. Then you could be twice as productive in the same hour. Well, the problem with this is there's a limit to how much we actually need to get done as employees. And see, this is where the problem begins. Take a look at this. If our efficiency expands too rapidly, and we could get so much more done in time, then more people are standing around doing nothing for a while. Well, at some point, offices, businesses, corporations begin to realize they are vastly overstaffed because they don't necessarily have twice as many PDFs to read. That is where the growth problem comes in in step two. We're going to talk about that. But I really want you to first internalize this and understand this for a moment. Let's say I'm a real estate agent and I can do 50 transactions per year alone. And with AI, let's say I could do 75 transactions per year. That's great. My capacity to do 75 transactions went up. That's fantastic. But what if I can only get my hands on 55 transactions of business? Well, yes, then I have more time for leisure or doing something else, maybe being a consumer in the economy. That'll come up in the next part as well. But the point is, just because I am more efficient does not guarantee I will be more productive because businesses take time to grow, to get more customers, to expand. Just if, let's put it, let's phrase it another way. Let's say you are a factory and you sell paper towels. Okay? You sell the best paper towels in your city, and you sell 100,000 paper towel rolls every single month. Okay, So 100,000 per month. That's great. You're killing it. 
Now AI comes in and it lets your employees be more efficient so that you now have the capacity of selling 150,000 per month. That's fantastic. But again, what if the demand only grew to 110,000? Well, if we overproduce, all we're gonna do is reduce the prices because we've created oversupply, so we reduce prices. Well, that doesn't really help our revenue or our margin because price declines, then just beget more price declines. It creates deflation. Deflation in the long term is great for consumers and it could beget more competition, but did it really grow the amount of demand for paper towels? No, <laughs> no, it didn't. Now again, maybe people have more time for leisure because they're so much more uh, efficient and so they're using paper towels more for some reason. But AI does not necessarily grow demand for goods and services. We call that gas, right? Goods and services. There's a limit to how much demand we have for goods and services. So again, if our efficiency stair steps with AI, but demand only grows like this, then we create eventually a gap where there are a lot of people who are getting paid to get a lot of stuff done that doesn't actually need to get done. We only need this much stuff done in the economy. That means we have a problem of overemployment at some point. And if you attach malinvestment to that, malinvestment because people believe that artificial intelligence and the revolution is going to do this and it'll go up and up and up and up forever, then more and more people are getting hired right now thanks to the artificial intelligence revolution when the reality is the opposite will likely end up happening. Layoffs, mass layoffs. But when does that happen? Well, folks, that actually happens in phase two. I call this the depletion and profit phase. So, when companies, even with artificial intelligence, realize, wait a minute, we've got so much more efficiency, but our demand curve is not all of a sudden growing twice as fast. It's hopefully growing, or worse, your demand curve is doing this, and it's just sort of lumpy and barely growing. That's not good, especially when you start having negative year-over-year -year numbers, kind of like something like Tesla might have for Q1 or Q2 this year compared to last. Something starts happening when you hit this kind of growth curve. Businesses start cutting expenses. For example, Tesla started slowing down its Chinese Shanghai auto manufacturing plant from its usual six and a half days of work down to just five. That's a red flag. We've talked about that in the Tesla videos, topic for really a different video. Uh, and, of course, if you want sort of my insights into specific fundamental analysis or my trading alerts, make sure you join those courses on Building Your Wealth. We do have an expiring coupon code on Easter. That's March 31st. Take advantage of that before we raise the price. You get all the buy-sell alerts if you're in stocks and psych. Got questions to bundle up? Email us at staffandmeetkevin.com and join us in the course member live stream for this sort of perspective. Okay, so demand not growing the way companies would hope creates cuts. Why would demand not continue to grow? Well, that's where depletion comes in. See, remember how everybody said, oh my gosh, everybody has so much excess savings. Well, the spending of that excess savings has really taken a long time. Excess savings went up, and we've been able to kind of milk those excess savings for a very long time. And quite frankly, even after we get to the point where we were before the pandemic, and we've spent through all of our excess savings from pre-pandemic or from during the pandemic, we'll still have savings to go through, some extent of savings to go through, just like we had some savings beforehand. Doesn't mean a lot. But eventually, excess savings deplete and debt goes up, right? So excess savings slowly bleed out and debt continues to go up. So those are your buy now, pay laters. Eventually, I'm very concerned that we're going to end up with, quite frankly, the next derivative of buy now, pay later, where basically you have people who bought a bunch of stuff on buy now, pay later, like groceries or other necessities, and then they need to get another buy now, pay later loan to pay off their first buy now, pay later loan. So it's kind of like refinancing buy now, pay later with buy now, pay later. Boy, I take a shot every time I just said buy now, pay later. Okay, maybe don't do that. Anyway, this becomes obviously a strain on consumers. Okay, but that's no problem if people have jobs. 
you can have a lot of debt. You can spend all of the money you make as long as you have a job. In fact, you could spend more than you make if you have a job and savings because your job slows the bleeding, so to speak, but you're bleeding. So eventually you're going to bleed out because your excess savings will deplete, your debt will be high, and then you'll be left with your just basically subsisting on your job to pay your debt. Okay, well this creates really, really big problems because when we now combine a consumer that's becoming more indebted with an artificial intelligence revolution that the stock market says is going to exponentially grow forever and the world has changed and all the greatest advances are all gonna happen within the next two years. Which, mind you, is total bullshit. <laughs> like, the stock market tries to price ahead 18 months usually, right? The AI revolution will last the rest of our lifetime. But are robots gonna be here tomorrow doing all of our work for us? No. Quite frankly, that might take 50 years. Look how long full self-driving took. I bought my first full self-driving car, a Tesla Model X in 2017, and I'm like, this stuff is amazing. It's gonna be so much better. Uh, in just a few years, we'll have robo-taxis. It's 2024 now. I still have version 12.3.1 doing stupid knucklehead stuff. Like yesterday, I come up to an intersection that looks like... This. this is going to be a little hard to get right. There we go. Okay, so we've got the number one lane here. We've got the number two lane here. We've got a bike lane here and then a giant curb kind of right here. Uh, this is sort of like a crosswalk curb. And then we've got uh, the number three lane, we'll call it, which is a right turn lane. Okay, so I got the latest version of FSD. And this freaking car pulls up and is like, uh, yeah, bro, we're just going to go straight right here and basically follows the bike lane into the curb until I hit the brakes. I'm like, come on, we should be past this by now. But no, this is why it's still called a supervised full self-driving artificial intelligence software, because even after seven years, we're still doing stupid stuff. Yes, have we taken leaps forward? Absolutely. But is it as much as we expected? No. So the same thing will be true again with artificial intelligence. So again, let's start putting this recipe together. We have artificial intelligence where expectations are here and reality is going to be way lower. So everything's going to take a lot more time, a lot more patience. Okay, patience in the stock market usually don't go hand in hand. Patience in the stock market is something that uh, people don't like. <laughs> people want their returns now. Okay, well that sets up for problems. Okay, fine. Next. Companies realize, wait a minute, we have all this staff that's more efficient, but are we really more productive? Well, our productivity is limited by demand, but consumers are constrained for our products, whether they're commercial consumers or individual retail consumers, they're constrained for our products because they're potentially highly indebted. The only sort of companies that aren't highly indebted are your Apple, Microsoft, and Google, and Facebook, who are going and buying all of the crazy AI chips, because the expectation, again, is this, when the reality is we're going to have a stair-stepper expectation. Okay, great, and there'll be setbacks along the way. So what happens after we start realizing, dang, we're really starting to grow like this rather than that exponential that we thought. What happens? Profit becomes the focus. And when profit becomes the focus at businesses, and businesses are not raising revenue, what is the first thing that they go to? They need to cut. S, G, and A, and their costs of goods sold, and also potentially their R&D. Well, guess what's in all of these segments? People, labor, labor gets cut. They say, hey, we got AI now, we made everybody 20% more efficient. That doesn't mean we're 20% more productive. So, let's cut 20% of people. And this is when you get to a phase that the Federal Reserve usually runs into. Unfortunately, it happens very, 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 very quickly. At some point, and I don't know when that is, but at some point, we will get negative job reads. Right now, economy still seems to be booming. Jobs reports are coming in great and strong. A lot of them are being filled by uh, government and social services as well as healthcare. Fine, that's fine. That's usually an end of cycle jobs kind of reading but we are still seeing a pickup in retail and hospitality. Some of the construction's coming back. So it's sort of a weird environment. That's why I'm not making this video saying, oh, everything's gonna crash and go to hell tomorrow. 
I don't know when this is going to happen. And unfortunately, I think trying to bet on when this is going to happen is, is very difficult because if you bet too early, you'll lose a lot of money. If you bet too late, you'll lose a lot of money. So the timing of this is very challenging. But at some point, we will get negative jobs reports. And unfortunately, the first declines in the jobs reports, unfortunately, they are self-fulfilling. Because here's what happens. Let's say our average job gain right now has been $240,000 a year. Or sorry, 240,000 jobs per month. Let's clarify that. 240,000 jobs per month. What happens when that all of a sudden goes down to 150,000? People are going to start paying attention. Not just people, but companies. They're going to go, wait a minute. Wow, jobs are really starting to slow. Oh no, next month, 75. Oh, oh no. That's usually a bad sign that we might start going into recession. What sets in? Fear. Well, what do people not want when there's fear? Less profit. So what happens? More cuts. And all of a sudden, you get a snowball of a joblessness recession. We don't know when that's going to come. That's the problem. At some point, it will come. And it will come when conditions are not ideal. In my opinion, you're going to have AI-driven valuations that are absolutely maxed out. So you have max AI valuations, quite frankly, with more Again, efficiency, but not more productivity. So now you have a capacity to cut. Because think about it. The businesses can still get the same amount of work done with less people. So valuations at max with the capacity to cut. Companies can just go, you know what? We got too fat. Cut. Thousands of jobs. Gone. Because they'll put the work on the other people who can then use AI to do the job of the others. Again. 20% more efficient without being 20% more productive means you have excess fat, people standing around the water cooler, and they get cut. All right, so valuations at max, a capacity to cut, declining profit, combine this with fear, what happens? The job recession starts. The job recession starts. When the job recession starts, what's next to go? Single family housing. Multifamily housing is already going through its little pooper right now, mostly because of high interest rates have really sort of destroyed developers. And you had this really weird thing happen in housing, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. But when job cuts hit, the jobs recession, single family becomes Im almost impossible to afford and also potentially max valuations. And then you get a housing correction. Now, I want to say something very interesting about where the housing market and especially multifamily market uh, is worst, in my opinion. So a lot of people, this is sort of just a pandemic reference, a lot of people during the pandemic, they moved from states like, I'll just use these as an example, California to Texas. It could be Florida, it could be Nevada, whatever, right? And so what happened is a lot of people went there, and so what they did is then you built more. Oh my gosh, prices went up, let's build a lot. Okay, well now you're actually starting to get some reversal, which is just a normalization. I'm not saying Texas is bad, it's just normal, you get a reversal. So you actually get people going to California again. Okay, well, what did you not do in California over the last few years? You didn't build. So no build. So that means in California, you're now left with less homes and potentially, again, more people as you go back to growth. Okay, well, that creates a supply challenge. So it actually drives prices up. Whereas in Texas, you're actually left with more homes, easier construction, red states a lot easier to build in, and less people once it normalizes, which means lower prices. So I think there are a lot of areas in the country that got overbuilt, and these overbuilt areas are going to have the greatest pain uh, in, in the next cycle. We're already starting to see some of that in multifamily. So ironically, these blue states that didn't build a lot because they have bad building policies, I do think they should be building more. I ran for governor on that premise. It's not a surprise. These states are going to end up with actually, weirdly, less pain than some of these other states. That's just a theory. <sighs> okay, so <laughs> what we have here is really a roadmap for issues. We have AI increasing efficiency, but not necessarily productivity. 
Now, yes, can the economy keep going? Can productivity go up, efficiency keep going up, and, and the bubble keep going on for a long time? Absolutely. But at the same time, a lot of people are seeing their consumer debt go way up, and their capacity to keep repaying go down, and their consumer savings go down, their excess savings deplete and go down. What you really need to keep this Ponzi going, so to speak, is you need more profit. As soon as the profit starts drying up at companies and you get consumer depletion, you start getting jobs cuts. Once that starts, you start the cycle. You start the next recession. This is exactly how the next recession starts. Because max valuations on AI, which will not come to fruition, max valuations on single family housing, which won't be affordable, combined with the fact that the companies that are wanting to survive can get enough done with AI and the efficiency they have without extra demand means a lot of people are gonna be out of a job. So, what do you personally do to protect yourself from this? Well, you have to work on your skills. You have to do absolutely everything in your power to make sure you are not only building a war chest of assets. It doesn't have to be cash, but assets. Even if the market goes down 50%, you want that 50% to still be enough to where you could survive. So I'm not saying don't invest. Just saying, have lots of assets. Use the good time now to minimize your debt, maximize your assets, build the businesses, the startups, the side hustles, build everything you can now in the good time. Because this AI euphoria is very likely way ahead of itself. And when you combine that with the debt cycle and the difference between product and efficiency, productivity and efficiency, you are going to have at some point in the future, I don't know when, but a massive correction. And these are the signs you want to look for. It all starts with jobs as a result of AI-driven efficiencies and a lack of productivity. Do not advertise these things that you told us here. I feel like nobody else knows about this. We'll, we'll try a little advertising and see how it goes. Congratulations, man. You have done so much. People love you. People look up to you. Kevin Pafrath there, financial analyst and YouTuber. Meet Kevin. Always great to get your take. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is not personalized advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show shall not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purposes of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services we may benefit from. I also personally operate an actively managed ETF. I may personally hold or otherwise hold long or short positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuer other than HouseHack, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Make sure if you're considering investing in HouseHack to always read the PPM at HouseHack.com.